Wright and Dr. Horace Huntley. Uh, Dr. Wright has been a longtime colleague of mine and uh, was a part of uh, the Marl Hall uh, takeover back in the day. Uh, I'm going to ask him to say just a little bit more about uh, himself and his role in that uh, Marl Hall takeover. You've heard quite a bit about uh, Dr. Huntley. Uh, and then we'll move into uh, the conversation about it's one thing uh, to do the takeover and to struggle, which uh, the young people did. How do you build a department? Uh, how does it come to be? And we're going to have a little bit of conversation about that. Uh, so John, will you talk just a little bit about your history and background? Glad to, very glad to do that, Rose. And again, I want to thank all of you for being here today to share this teach-in with us and the opportunity to talk about the creation of the Department of African American and African Studies, uh, the context out of which it grew, its implications for the present and for the future. And it's particularly bracing for me, I think I can speak for Horace as well, to see so many young faces out here, young, attentive faces, defying the current uh, notion that uh, millennials and new millennials have attention spans no longer than the time between commercials. <laughs> because you all do seem to be attentive, and I, I hope and think that you're interested in what we have to say uh, today. Part of what uh, looking at you and your young faces reminds me is how young, in fact, uh, we were in 1968 and 1969. And I think one of the things that keeps us going in the, the world of education and community activism is, is faith in, in youth, in the notion that young people uh, grasp intuitively and are willing to take on intellectually and politically the need to struggle generation from generation to generation. We were part of what I constantly tell my students is a transgenerational enterprise, a transgenerational enterprise. And uh, Rose and Horace and Warren and all of us, those of us who are members of AAAC, back in 1967 and 1968 and 69, although we may not have fully realized it at the time, uh, were taking up uh, challenges that the generations of black students before us had addressed one way or another, and the generations before them as well. So thinking about, uh, thinking about the founding of our department, now 50 years old, actually want to take us back generations. Generations. Uh, the beginnings of what we now call uh, black studies actually go back to the end of the 19th century and to the, the founding of the American Negro Academy in 1897. And Alexander Crummel and W.E.B. Du Bois, a long list of scholars at the end of the 19th century, who then felt the need to bring together scholars concerned with the history and legacy and culture and future prospects and political needs of the African-American community in an academic context. The, uh, the, the, the takeovers of administration buildings in the 1960s, early 1970s, that we were a part of 50 years ago, were not the first round of black student protests on American campuses. And in fact, the decade of the 1920s that we associate with the Harlem Renaissance, the new Negro movement, what Langston Hughes called the Black Renaissance, was actually the first era of black student takeovers of administration buildings and attempts to reform the curriculum of higher education. Those protests took place largely at the historically black colleges and universities in the Deep South. And an earlier generation of black scholars led by figures like W.E.B. Du Bois, all right, John Hope Franklin, Carter G. Woodson, Alain Locke, and so forth, combined with students then 
who believe that the historically black colleges and universities are perhaps more than any other spot in higher education and be the place where the study of African peoples, their histories and leg legacies and prospects ought to be focused. So a whole round of black student protests took place at places like Howard University and Fisk and Atlanta and Dillard and so forth in the 1920s. This has largely been forgotten. It's, it's been, become less a part of the discussion of the legacy of black studies movement than it needs to be. In my own personal terms, um, <laughs> my father and my aunt were students here at the university in the 1930s during the depths of the Great Depression. And at a time when on this campus, the, uh, the president uh, for whom this union is currently named, <laughs> Cox Memorial Union, had he instituted a, a, a policy with the support of, of, of several of his deans and central administrators of Jim Crow on this, northern style of Jim Crow on this public land grant university campus. Barring black students, Native American students living in dormitories, restricting the roles of black athletes all right, on contests, intercollegiate contests with schools in the deep south that were formally segregated, reinforcing the exclusionary policies of fraternities and sororities and social groups on campus and so forth. And they formed in the middle of the 1930s, the very first black student organization that we're aware of on this campus called the Council of Negro Students to protest against Lotus Kaufman and Dean Nicholson and Coffey's and Millbrook's attempts to create Jim Crow academic policies on this campus. My aunt, Martha Wright, who then was one of only a handful of women students in what was then called the School of Technology, Right, which would later become again what today is the College of Science and Engineering. Right, my aunt was both the president of the black women's sorority on campus and she became the president of the Council of Negro Students. She and many of her colleagues and friends, there was a very small number of African American students on this campus then, 30, 40 at best. But a very distinguished group nonetheless who went on to very distinguished careers. Um, they uh, banded together. They brought connections from the local community. That meant representatives of the Urban League, the NAACP, Settlement Houses, the Halley Q. Brown Settlement House, the Phyllis Wheatley uh, 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 House in, uh, in North Minneapolis, together to support their efforts. Local black newspapers. Many of the spokesmen, Cecil Newman, had regular columns about the struggles on campus then in the 1930s and early 1940s over those kinds of issues. I grew up hearing, again, in my family and most of my parents' friends, stories about the, about the University of Minnesota and the struggles that they had faced then. So I had, although it wasn't fully formulated when I was an undergraduate, a sense, again, of this transgenerational process. And that, of course, is, is linked to uh, um, I think what, uh, what Horace made very clear was uh, important influence on us coming along, again from an, a, an elder generation, an off-campus generation, the importance of developing a, a, a historical consciousness that can take us in our imaginations and in our decision-making in the larger world out of the narrow confines of our own personal experience. Mahmoud el Khati played a central role for me as Horace said, for him and for so many of us, all right, from outside the, 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 the academic world, at least initially, that he would be pulled into it, a bit reluctantly later on, um, of an alternate uh, frame of reference, an alternate set of questions to raise about, uh, about the whole historical process. So, again, um, I was, as Horace mentioned, I was at the time of, uh, the, of, the, uh, of the takeover, I was, uh, uh, of a tiny, tiny number of black students in uh, the Institute of Technology. My undergraduate major was electrical engineering. And I was the only African-American student in any of the courses that I took in the, 
is the new technology at that point in time. For me, strap first and then AAAC, black student organizations became important ways of navigating socially and psychologically. All right. a, a, uh, in many ways, foreboding atmosphere on this campus in a source of solidarity, friendship, community, and of action. So part of what, of course, the ultimate development of black studies is about is indeed this open, broad, broad matter of, again, of, of solidarity, of personal growth and development, of historical consciousness, and moving all of these things into the sphere of action. I've gone on too long, Rose, then we pause. That's Dr. Right, right y'all. <laughs> So we know that uh, the department officially uh, offered classes for the first time in the fall of uh, 1969. Is that correct? So my, my question to the both of you um, was to talk a little bit about uh, and uh, share with uh, our attendees how the department was built in the early years. Uh, were there students involved? Uh, what was the vision, uh, how were faculty recruited, and um, just say a little bit about that. Uh, Dr. Huntley? Now you do know that that was 50 years ago. <laughs> and you're asking us, <laughs> uh, can I just say I don't remember you know, it reminds me of uh, my grandmother that's growing up. She would always call me my brother's name, my cousin's name. I said, Mom, you don't know my name? She said, well, boy, you just stay here. You know <laughs> and I stayed here, and I, <laughs> I was uh, thinking about memory. I went to a service station one day to get gas. I put gas in the car, went in to, this is when you had to go in to pay uh, for your gas. And I came back out, and nobody was in the car with me. I came back out and opened the back door. Not only did I open the back door, I got in the back seat, Mark. <laughs> Not only did I, get in the seat. I closed the door. And then I looked around. I said, oh, something's wrong. And then I, you know, you try to make an excuse for what you've done. I started looking around on the floor to see if, see if anybody was looking. So, Rose, yes, I do forget. <laughs> but uh, it was a time when we had very, I had little experience in doing what we were attempting to do. Uh, we did know that we had to have uh, faculty. So uh, the first person that came to our mind was Mark Moon because he was faculty in the street. He was faculty at Sabathia and at the way and any place else that anybody would allow him to talk. And he would talk for days on our history. So that was one of the first things that we wanted to make sure that happened. Uh, there were other individuals that John knew that, uh, that were locals. Uh, what was his brother's name? Craig? Earl Craig? Earl Craig. Oh, yeah. Earl Craig was here. Uh, I see Steve Winfield is, is there, and Steve was very actively involved in the struggle as well. In fact, he gave up a career uh, in baseball to, to be involved. I see Mary Merrill is somewhere out there, and she was one of those individuals that was staunch. You know, you had to have certain people that was just there. And each of us, uh, we had committees from AAAC that worked with faculty members uh, and administrators in actually developing the program for African American Studies. And um, it was a learning experience. 
for, for, for most of us. Um, but we, we did have the wherewithal, well, we had the wherewithal to understand that there were certain things that were, that were necessary and that we had to have happen. And um, we simply stuck with the task of development. Uh, and many times we really didn't know exactly what we were doing, but we knew that it needed to be done. So uh, young students, uh, we were basically sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So we did not have the experience of establishing the department. But guess what? Isn't that department still standing? It's still standing. That's, that's all I want to know. John, you joined uh, somewhat later officially. I know you had to go on and get a PhD and do all those things. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the later years? And our official apartment is African American and African Studies. And we're going to have a panel this afternoon that gets into that. But uh, would you say a little bit about that unfolding? Well, I can say more than a little bit. And while I'm like, like Horace here, it is a stretch sometimes to go back 50 years. I do remember at least some of the details that we were involved in. And it was, as Horace says, uh, a part of improvisational enterprise. Because the creation of, of, of black studies, uh, in many ways, didn't have precedent at large. I alluded earlier to these earlier phases of struggle, of intellectual and academic struggle that go back to the end of the 19th century. But they didn't result. Now those early phases had resulted in the creation of formal academic programs and departments and higher education institutions. And that takes you, of course, into a, a complex institutional and bureaucratic enterprise with complex systems of credentialing, all right, verification of authority, of funding, and so forth. And that opened up a whole Pandora's box, as it were. And our department, like uh, departments around the country, had to wrestle with a number of, of contending forces, not just those from the institution we were trying to transform. Right? Because in many ways, the university's administrative uh, 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 entities did not know exactly how to proceed. I did serve, again, along with, with students and representatives of the local community on some of the early search committees that hired the first faculty in the department. I was a graduate student uh, then recently, yes, it, it, under, underway graduate student, and I was also running the Martin Luther King program uh, in the years from 1970 to, to, to 1973, but uh, uh, we, we had to, to, to go in the country to find scholar, potential scholars to hire. Matt Moot and I have served on, on, on search committees that interviewed some of the earliest candidates for faculty positions in African American and African studies. And uh, yeah, the whole question about what in fact are the qualities one looks for in scholars in this emerging new field. We had to address the, the issues of differences in, in, traditional, in traditional disciplinary outlooks and training. In some ways, there were faculty already on campus who had been part of the development of African studies curriculum. Right? Because after the Second World War, African studies had begun to become part of the formal academy as the Western world began to cope with the emergence from colonial domination of, of countries across the African continent and throughout what we now refer to as the diaspora. And African, African studies had emerged out of that context, and there were scholars on faculty already who played a significant role early in the department. But there were differences in outlook and approach between tr traditional disciplinary trained Africanists on the one hand, African American scholars on the other. Some of those differences were cultural, some of them were political. All right, at that time, a good, a, a powerful force in African studies was, uh, was, was Marxism and Marxist perspectives. And many, for instance, of the African American scholars were not Marxists. And so there were political clashes over that. Also, from the vantage point of, of community activists who may not have found the theories and ideologies in the academy to their liking one way or the other, brought oftentimes a, 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 a whole 
different, a third eye to the enterprise, all right? less beholden to the, uh, the, the ideologies and the institutional structures and practices of the formal academy. And uh, from the outset, again, one of the, issues, the strong issues that, that community activists brought was the need for engagement all right, with community institutions, formal and informal, with Sutherland House, with places like the Wave in uh, North Minneapolis, and the Halley Q. Brown Center in St. Paul, and the Inner City Youth League, and so forth, or with prison populations, all right, or with a, an array of, of uh, government programs fund, funded to, to, to address uh, uh, women and children uh, who were outside of the traditional systems of support, but who needed educational support. So all of these things had to become part of our, 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 our debates about what, in fact, the department ought to be. From the outset, we were very strongly committed to, to this department not being bound by the, the, the barriers that insults too often insulate the academy from the, the community at large. So while in recent years this university has, has created an art, a department of outreach, we now have a vice president of outreach, all right? We were, <laughs> outreach was central to our mission from the, from the outset. And that became a source of tension in part because the academy historically has not rewarded community outreach in terms of the, the, the systems of credentialing and promotion within the academy. So in many cases, the things that we found particularly important to do, we were not going to be rewarded with. We were rewarded for in the context of, of the, the working in the academy. And you know, that, that vision of uh, academic, academic excellence and social responsibility has been the mantra for uh, all the departments in terms of that uh, long history. Uh, but departments have changed. Uh, con the content, uh, what is important. Uh, so there have been shifts. Uh, when I arrived uh, in, the, in 1986, the, the idea of transforming black studies to be who are the women, to be much more inclusive around uh, the gender question because that had not been at the heart of some of the earlier considerations. And you know, as we're moving into uh, the 21st century, uh, that has become a quite central concern, as well as uh, a whole range of interdisciplinary issues, which you'll hear a little bit more about uh, this afternoon. But there have been a number of faculty who have come through, uh, including uh, doctors Geneva Southall, uh, John Terryborn, um, Reggie Buckner, and others. They've transitioned, but played a dramatic role and impact on the development of uh, the department. I don't know if you wanted to say a little bit about that. Well, also, on the matter of the, the place of, of women's scholars in the enterprise, I think I, I can accurately say that our department, very early on, had a very strong representation of black women scholars on the faculty. You mentioned the names of some of them, but the Jada Southall, and Anita Tucker, Joseph Johnson, who would become a, 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 a university regent, my mood is offering a, from, from the side letters, one of the names. Of, first chair. First chair, yes, chairs of the department and so forth, for black, black women scholars. So uh, we, we had, I think, a strong uh, record in that, re that regard. Again, we also had visiting uh, uh, instructors in the department, again, who came from community institutions, one way or the other. There's some uh, in the audience here. I saw T. Williams here earlier. T, where are you? There he is, all right. With a long association with, with, with Phyllis Wheatley in North Minneapolis, but as well, but has been a dedicated educator himself. Uh, so we, we, we had the draw again in part from a wide array of educational uh, resources and talent, most of which was off the university campus in those earlier years. So, uh, you know, also I'm going to say this more broadly about the, about the Black Studies movement because we were part of, again, you know, what was a national Black Studies movement. And it had begun on the campuses in this, in this country in California, San Francisco State. As early as 1965, students were organizing with community allies to create, to, to, to recreate the curriculum and, and, and to generate programs and departments that had some institutional authority and funding that wasn't 
completely captured to the, to the, to the short cycles of interinstitutional funding along the way. Uh, and between 1968, 69, and 19, or the early 1970s, the, the numbers, the estimates vary, but between, somewhere between 600 and 800 programs and departments of black studies, sometimes called Africana studies, black studies, African American, African studies, and so forth, were created at institutions across this country, between 600 and 800. Within the first five or six years, at least a third of them were gone. Because that they had in, insufficient support, internal and external. Over the course of the next decade, another third of the, the initial 600 to 800 were gone. Um, so in that sense, we are survivors, part of that third or perhaps a quarter of the departments and programs established initially that have managed to weather the years. And the challenges, again, have, have, have been profound uh, along the way. And most of, of our departments still struggle for equitable resources, staffing, visibility, et cetera, in the institutions in which we're embedded. Whether, again, these, these programs have been created in public land grant institutions like this one or in private uh, universities and so on. Um, those, are, those are things that we can certainly talk about if you're interested yeah, in yeah, 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 down yeah. the line. But that's part of this kind of broader spectrum of the Black Studies movement, in which, again, I'll, I'll let the Horace pull the microphone here. In terms of the, you know, Horace was talking in terms of his intellectual influence about the books and so forth that we were reading at the time. Um, Part of what I think it's important to remember is that uh, the Black Studies Movement came out of the rise of the Black Power Movement by contrast with the Civil Rights Movement. And those years of the mid-60s were the years in which the Civil Rights Movement was in crisis. Dr. King's leadership was in crisis. All right? The 1963 March on Washington has become so iconically associated with Dr. King and, uh, and the dream, right? the last five years of his life were in, in intensely embattled, in part because of the challenges to the civil rights agenda mounted by former student activists like Stokely, Stokely Carmichael and H. Rapp Brown and so many others who turned to cultural nationalism, to, to the models of decolonization and, and national liberation being created by, again, on a global scale, by the movements for liberation abroad. And those forces all right, were, were very, very powerful in terms of the Black Studies movement uh, at large. And they, let, they, ended, they ended up creating another kind of split in the movement in those early years. We experienced it here as well, between what would come to be called Afrocentrism. On the one hand, we identify with figures like Malefi Asante and Ron Karenga, and um, more traditional multidisciplinary African and African American studies of the kind that's rooted uh, more in, in, the, in the works of the Du Boises and St. Clair Drakes and so on. And those, uh, those divisions to some extent still operate. Afrocentrism was never a, a dominant move, but it was an important part of the debate going on in departments at large and certainly in this department here. I'm going to ask Horace to weigh in because I remember uh, when you came to my class, you talked about the demand of the students for a department rather than a program. And I think what John has alluded to uh, shows the the wiseness of that that particular demand. Yeah, yeah as John talked, it became clear to me that uh, that was one of our primary issues whether we were going for a department or for a program. And that would not, not only be an issue here at U, but all over the country. The department uh, was more, of course, more substantial than a program, because there you had, uh, you had, you have salaried individuals in that structure. Whereas a program basically would take faculty from all over the campus. So therefore, you would not have an African-American professor, African-American uh, disciplined professor. You may have a, a, his, a historian in the history department, a sociologist in sociology. But what we were going for was to have each of those individuals 
within our department. And when I left here, see, I left here early. I left here in 1970, uh, before much of what you guys were talking about was happening. And, but I had learned just enough to go to, eventually go to Birmingham and establish, attempt to establish a department. I was never successful because the institution uh, was not committed to that and I didn't have the support of, of other folk around me. So we only established the, the program. So, but that is very, very significant. You know, you talk about San Francisco State, Cornell, Harvard, these other institutions. We also had similar situations at, at, at Tuskegee, for instance, or at Howard. In fact, there was a, a takeover at Howard and the students uh, demanded uh, for how to become a black institution <laughs> rather than a Negro institution, as it was termed. Uh, so we, we had that kind of situation going on throughout uh, the, the academy and in both black and white institutions and northern and southern institutions. But in the South, Primarily, you had black institutions that were developing, not white institutions at that early stage. You know. You know, I would uh, make a couple of observations. Uh, true enough, John, there were women uh, always in the department, but it's a shift in uh, the curriculum that I'm really referencing. Uh, when you ask, you know, how do you really teach black studies? How do you really teach the history of African people if that part of that experience is missing. So certainly contemporarily and today, there are a number of younger scholars, uh, one of which we just recruited uh, a couple of years ago, where the focus is actually on that experience. Uh, the black women's studies tradition as it folds into uh, black studies. And that's a very critical, I think, shift. Uh, and if we can take that shift further, uh, the, the many expressions of black life, including the queer black experience. All of these are aspects of the way the field is evolving that makes it somewhat distinctive, but at its heart always connected to the idea that uh, black studies is descriptive, prescriptive, and always connected to the needs of the community. If we lost that, we would lose the essence of what uh, the field has been and what it has represented. Uh, and by the way, uh, Dr. Josie was supposed to be with us. Uh, she was with us when we initially had the event scheduled for uh, January 29th when that evil, evil polar vortex came through. And unfortunately, she couldn't she could join us today, but uh, sends her uh, regards and was a part of the early foundation of, uh, of the program and uh, certainly built the department in its early stages. You're going to hear from Professor El Khadi a little bit later on in the afternoon. He can fill in some of uh, the portions of the discussion um, as well as uh, a few other uh, folk. Uh, we're going to close this out so our audience can finally get a chance to talk and to ask questions. But do y'all have any final observations about uh, the department. I will say uh, that it takes a great deal of political will, a great deal of commitment uh, to launch the department. You, you saw what an important political effort that was, but to keep it going is as much a political effort, uh, is as much uh, uh, an issue of, of struggle, is as much uh, as we look into perhaps the next 50 years, what it will take in the context of a very, very vexed U.S. society. Uh, so y'all get the last word. Uh, one of the things that we often, when we think about the Black Studies movement, we tend to focus attention on undergraduate uh, programming and uh, scholarship and teaching and so forth. But the development of graduate level programs uh, is also an important part of this larger enterprise. And there are still today only a small number of uh, masters and PhD programs in African and African American studies around the country. 
Here, uh, part, of, and part of my experience as a graduate student was uh, I, I, <laughs> I shifted gears in graduate school. As, as, as I said, my undergraduate training was in the, was in the sciences and engineering. And uh, in part because of the impact of the Black Studies Movement and my own engagement with AAAC and community groups and organizations, I found that my real passion increasingly had shifted to, to, uh, to, to Black Studies. But there were no graduate programs uh, at the time. And although we had uh, one of the more distinguished and older American Studies programs in the country here, American Studies, when I began, uh, was essentially a WASP studies program. Um, no, in, the, in the entire time I was in the American Studies program, we read not a single text by or about an African, African American author. And uh, you know, that was ultimately very frustrating. But we also had developing here a, a pioneer program at the graduate level called the History of African Peoples. It was one of the early cross cultural comparatives. Uh, Africana studies programs in the country brought together scholars from an array of disciplines across the university and significantly a group of black graduate students almost a dozen or more all together as a as a group at the same time studying together and I ultimately was able to cobble together a, a, a program uh, between American Studies and the History of African Peoples program that made it possible at the time to do, to do, to, to move where I wanted to go. But, in terms of institutional support, as dynamic as the History of African Peoples program was, it was largely the product of, of, in, of student and individual faculty initiative and didn't have the kind of institutional support. Right? There were no fellowships for the graduate students in the History of African Peoples programs. The individual students had to find their own ways to support themselves along the, the process as I did. Again, working again as an administrator, running the MLK program and so forth, teaching part-time and so on. Um, you know, those issues, those, many of those issues still face us today. So again, we'll get a chance to talk about this later on, but, but going forward again, in terms of this, this transgenerational enterprise and the tasks that each generation has to take on and understand all right, and try to meet, there's still much, much to be done. Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to, my son was born in 1973. His name was Marcus Malik L. Shabazz. <laughs> uh, those of you, of course, are aware, it was named after Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X. Uh, so when he went off to school, <clears throat> he called me one night about midnight and said, Dad, we just took over the administration bill. And I said, you what? <laughs> he said, we just took over. I said, I didn't send you to school to take over the administration bill. He said, well, he said, well you did it. I said, that was different. <laughs> and uh, so he told me, Dad, you're going to be talking about Moral Hall. I said, yeah. He said, you make sure you tell them that you are a traitor because you didn't support me when we took over. <laughs> so now you all are witnesses. I have committed, I mean, com yeah, made the, the promise that I made, I have kept it, and so I have shared that information with you. <laughs> well, let's thank our panelists and uh... And are you someplace around to kind of guide people through this, this uh, audience piece? Uh, just a little bit of an instruction of what they're, uh, we're asking people to do? Uh, hello everyone, my name is Ana. So I'm an international grade trained student uh, from Brazil and I'm here just to guide the talk back. So, we would like you to have some interaction uh, and talk to people in your table. So I'll ask you to introduce yourselves and to create questions together. When you have your questions, you can go to the microphones. There is one right there and another one right there. And you have about 10 minutes to do that, so uh, not much time, unfortunately. And one other thing is, 
uh, I would like to see intergenerational uh, groups. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you see tables with just uh, younger students and you are an adult, so please move there and vice versa. So just to remind you, introduce yourselves, uh, create questions together, find a volunteer to read your questions in the microphone, and you will be stopped at 11.25. Do you understand it? Was that a question? You got your questions? Can we get some people at the mic? <laughs> oh, we have one over here. Want some young folks? Oh, okay, we got another over there. All right, let's start. Even old people can make things work. Just one more thing before you get going with the question. Y'all heard uh, uh, Professor al Qadi's name mentioned over and over and over again? Well, here he is. Take a good look. <laughs> All right, go right ahead. Dr. Brewer, I'm not a young person. I'm probably the oldest person in the room. You're looking at 84. Uh, but let me say this, in spite of these young people, and I was one of those people who, at the time of the Mar-a-Lago -Law takeover, I was one of those people who circled Mar-a-Lago -Law on the outside. And Horace has told this story so many times. Horace, the only one, knew that I had a pistol in my back pocket, because that's what he's saying those people do when they think they're going to encounter policemen. Now, I haven't said that. This department, it sits on a land-grant university. African-Americans alone in this state spend $6 billion in the metropolitan area to the economy, over $500 million in taxes. If you look at the makeup of this university, from administration to faculty to the lowest clerks, you do not see us represented. But I got a quick story to tell you and then a challenge. A few years ago, I encountered a man named Lawford Baxter, who had taken his PhD under Robert Jones in the Department of Agriculture and Food Production. Lawford has a company called Cut Fruit Express, located in Invergrove Heights as a Jamaica, naturalized Jamaican citizen. He's here, he's an American citizen, naturalized. He's been operating a business that's now employing over 130 people and at about $28 million. He tried to sell to the University of Minnesota through their food service provider, Armark. The university actually allowed their general counsel to buy him off when he sued them to do business, when he said, I won't take a dime. His lawyer said to him, Lawford, they're going to drag you through court for five years and won't spend a nickel with you, but take the money and come back in five years. That is a moral and underpinning to this story. When I discovered that, I went to the state of Minnesota and I found as a land-grant university, you're not liable to any of the laws governing how the state spends its money. So it's exempt. That's going to take a legislative change in order to force this university who use our tax money to build and grow, to buy from us. Now, how many students you feed here every day? And we're going to ask you to get to the... That would be 40, right. that would be 40 more jobs that they could sell to the university. My point simply is this the challenge. 
that those who are studying African American studies understand it's also about economics. Thank, Thank you. you. And you didn't introduce yourself. You must. I'm sorry. I am Bill English. I currently run a project called the North Job Creation Team out of University, the Robert J. Jones Urban Research and Outreach Center. Thank you, Mr. English. Do we do side or we're gonna do kind of back and forth here? There was a go right ahead with the question. Is it on? Thank you. Okay, so um, as seniors, uh, a lot of us, if not all of us, um, could be going to predominantly white institutions. How do you recommend organizing black students together to ensure black voices are important and being heard in an academic space? Excellent question. You all hear that question? Uh, they are seniors in high school. How would you recommend uh, students who are going to PWI, predominantly white institutions, organizing themselves to Weather the storm, as was described by Mr. English. Yeah. I talked about that to some degree yesterday with uh, a bunch of young black men. Um, the organization, you have to, in organizing anything, you simply have to have uh, the will to do whatever it is that you you attempt to organize for. If you're talking about organizing to develop uh, a foundation and, and to be a sturdy organization, then just start organizing. You firstly, if we wanted to organize, we want to organize, say, a triple AC. Rose and I. John would get together and then we'd simply approach other folk who would be, who we think would be interested or wouldn't be interested. We will convince them to be. But understand one thing, when you're organizing, you're never going to get everyone. There'll be a few people that would adhere to what you were attempting to do but you have to go on and organize anyway. Because if you fail, if you're waiting for the crowd, guess what? They're not coming. Until you uh, take over the building. And then you're gonna have some people say, well, I didn't bargain for this, so I'm not coming. But the key is, is to get started. Get started with your organization process and don't quit and things will fall in place. But don't think it's going to get done simply because you want it to happen. And Thank let you. me add to what, to what uh, Horace has just said there. Um, you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel in this regard. Right. The issue that you're talking about has been faced by students elsewhere in this state and around the country over time. So there are precedents for you to draw on. So part of, of preparing uh, to, 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 to force your school system to respond to your educational and curricular needs is to do some of the background research, to prepare your own case, to see what's been done elsewhere that you can use effectively in this context. In that regard, you're much better equipped today than we were 50 years ago. You've got the internet and all the, the whole array of multimedia sources to put you in quick contact with of kind of models for the changes that you're looking for. Um, also, you can you have state institutions there, right? departments of education and so forth, uh, regional uh, uh, superintendents of schools and so forth. One of the things that our department over the years uh, was, was involved with, with some regularity, was teacher training programs of various kinds. 
many of which were involved with curricular reform, again, in the K-12 system, in the community colleges, and so on. So there again, there are models that you can draw on as you go forward trying to get your school system to recognize and address your needs. And again, these are, we're, we're talking about public schools, public schools. Um, this, you know, this, this university, again, was a land grant university. Yeah. And <laughs> one of the in interesting twists on the takeover of moral law, I, this past John, year, we're gonna, we have a long line. <laughs> <laughs> this land grant university, like public land grant universities and colleges across this country, right, came out of the struggles in the 19th century, in the years leading up to the Civil War over the need for public education. All right, at a time when education, higher education was limited to the elites. So, draw on those traditions. Justin Morrill, for whom Morrill Hall was named, was a Vermont legislator of working class background who was an abolitionist, who believed that both working people and slaves and ex-slaves had a right to education. I'm going to take a facilitator's uh, prerogative. We're going to have to keep the responses short. Uh, we, as you can see, we have a wealth of knowledge. And that, from my perspective, means that uh, this conversation is, is going to have to continue. But uh, we have students who are also going to be going to their own sessions a little bit around lunch. So let's try to get uh, quick responses uh, and know that they are not satisfactory in, in the whole scheme of things. Uh, Mike, would you want to say a couple of things? Okay. I want to respond to that question. You've done it very well. First thing I want to say to everybody is good morning, good morning. to you all. Thank you so much. My heart is pumping because this is not everyday thing here. You know, I want to thank Rose and her collaborators, whoever it was. Yes. This many young minds to come to something like this. This is very hard um, in my life to be able to talk to young people. Let me say this. I learned this from Julius Nairi. Julius Nairi was the president of Tanzania, one of the early African countries to gain independence. And he and it's so fundamentally real, we overlook it. He says the only wealth that any people have, culture, group, ethnicity, or its youth, or its young people, that's real wealth. Gold is not. A Cadillac ain't real wealth. Human beings are the most valuable resource that young human beings, that any people of any color, anywhere on this earth, are its real wealth. This is not wealth. Somebody made this. <laughs> this is not wealth. Everything up here, everything I got on but my birthday suit, <laughs> somebody made it. <laughs> A human being made it. That's what we need to understand. I want I think that was great. I know how John feels. He's full of, he wants to get this stuff out. <laughs> the young people, it's like having a uh, regurging, what, what is that what big word? Maybe get it out. Because yeah. 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 you may not have another chance. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're on this side, right? Okay, right ahead. I'm Kennedy Roberts, and I'm a junior at USAL. And the question we had was, how did the administration react like uh, during the creation process of the Afro? American Studies program. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? What was the university response? What was the university response once the Morrill Hall takeover happened? The university response is, I, I want to read just a couple of minutes to say I'm, I'm conscious of the time. It behaves like any system, uh, any oppressive system, and I consider the university a part of the oppressive system, the apparatus which oppresses black people because it's an institution 
most racism is expressed institution. And when I say racism, I want to be crystal clear. When I use the word racism, I mean white supremacy. That's what it is. <laughs> There's no series of racism. There's no Indian racism. There's no black racism. This is an invention of modern Europe. And you have to understand that. I'm sure some of you will get it. That all these little things we're dealing with, the big little things, are symptoms. The cause of this is the doctrine of white supremacy. And the birth of Europe about 400 years ago, and the invention of white people and Negroes and Indians who don't live in India. This, these are all new. Uh, it's a world order that came in 500 years ago on the heels of Columbus's calculated era. You know, he didn't know where he was. After he got back, he didn't know where he'd been. He didn't know he discovered America. But that's what started it all. The creation of white people, the invention of the Negro, and of, of Indians who are savages and who had civilizations over here long before Europe emerged. You, know, you couldn't eat what you eat without Native Americans because most, more than 60% of all the food products in the world was grown in this hemisphere. You say Irish potato. Irish potato is from the America. It was transplanted to Irish and it became their major center of their diet. It's not, it's got a darn thing to do with Irishmen. <laughs> but when they, they made it major, it's a Native American crop. Most of what you eat on the market comes from this hemisphere. That's very important for you to know. And that's a good start. I can talk about Africans too. <laughs> so you heard that, a negative response, right? Okay, on this side. Hi, my name is Howie and I go to Washington Tech and I'm a senior. One of my questions are, how did the media react when the department took over and how did you guys deal with it? I think it's similar to the, the last question. Uh, it's always been a political struggle for the things that Professor al just said. Uh, building a black presence in a white institution that is resistive to that is an ongoing struggle. So it was a resistive at that time. Uh, it continued over time to be resistive and we're still dealing with with issues uh, today. Does that get at what you're talking about? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Simone Hall. Um, I'm a junior at Burnsville High School, and I'm a part of the Black Student Union there. I'm the treasurer, and it's relatively new. Um, the president is right there. I just want to shout out to Rama Abdullahi. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my question was, um, do you have any general advice for the Black Student Union at our school? just in general. General advice for a black student union at their school, their high school students. Well, in terms of advice to you, you have to, again, organization is the most important thing. You have to organize and develop foundation. And once you've organized, you develop foundation, and then you create the, uh, the likability of the, 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 the way in which you will carry yourself. And as a result of the way that you put your credentials out there, you will attract other folk. So organization, develop the organization. Uh, make sure that you develop a uh, strong foundation because you're not simply developing it for you. You're developing it for those people that's going to come behind you in five and ten years. All right, thank you. Thank you. Decide, identify yourself. Hello, um, my name is Marco Ndosi. I am an independent scholar. My father, Eliwira Ndosi, was um, a graduate student in economics during this period and I think was either part of the takeover or certainly part of supporting it. Um, my question is to ask. Um, about your reflection on the development of the Black Studies Department and how it's had an impact on the curriculum across the university and um, also particularly to the experience that black students and African diasporic students have at the university. Thank you. That's a big John question. Yeah, it's a big one. John, John you do the particulars, but I'll say this. <laughs> 
Uh, that's good. And what do you do when you want to do something? Whatever it is you want to do, organize. <laughs> Organization is the key to it all because that's what you are up against is organization. You, that's number one, that's a principle. Organize, Kwame Nkrumah used to say, organize, 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 exclamation point. Um, you, you know, um, I'm glad you mentioned your, your dad and I, the lady who asked the last question, were good friends, I think, from Tanzania, good man. I want you smart guys to look up in Life Magazine, uh, 1970. I know you're smarter than me, so you know how to look up this stuff on the computer. I don't know how to do that. The Life Magazine, and there's an article exposing the University of uh, Minnesota connection to this, the, the spy thing of, um, of uh, Hoover's program. What is it called? The, Cointel Pro, okay. There's a picture in Life Magazine of myself, three blacks, myself, Sil Davis, who was like my brother and headed the uh, community center that I worked with, and her father. Give me his first name. Elias. Elias. He was there, he's from Tanzania. He was an expose in Life Magazine of what later became known as uh, Cointel Pro. And some students snuck into Fort Snelling. I don't know how they got the records, but the Army Intelligence was a part of Cointel Pro, along with CIA and so forth. We were the three blacks and about 30 varieties of leftists, everybody from communist to socialist, of people who are persons of interest. I've been a person of interest to the national government for most of my adult life, and I'm happy to be so. <laughs> I mean, can I, I don't, we, it's, it's high time, it's high noon. <laughs> it's time Donald Trump is making a mistake by opening pink Pandora's box. You're gonna see something for the next year or two, might even civil war might break out again anywhere in this country. We're that close. So I, I'm not answering a question. Yeah, yeah. But you put some yeah, I gotta say that on the brain. Let me, let me say this. Um, I know that I don't, I'm, because you're so full of it. You want young people to know. Yeah. There's a program also. And John, very quickly, just because we're, we're almost at time. OK, I'll, tr I'll try to respond briefly to Mark Way's question. Um, as is the case uh, with African-American social movements over time. Um, we are oftentimes, again, a catalyst uh, that ripples throughout the society at large or institutions. That was the case with the Moral Hall takeover in this campus and the founding of the Department of African American and African Studies, the Martin Luther King program, and all the things that came out of it. In terms of the university curriculum, what would follow in the wake of the creation of, of the Department of African American and African Studies, later that year, the very first Department of American Indian Studies in this country was founded on this campus. Within two years, the Chicano Studies Program was founded. All right? Within three to four years, Women's Studies was founded. All of these were reform movements of the curriculum that, that, that became part of the reverberating waves of the Moral Hall takeover and the challenges and changes that grew out of that enterprise. So we think it had a profound profound impact on the university in that regard, and in many ways helped transform intellectual life and social life on this campus. Um, again, prior to the, to the takeover, uh, there had been no university, uh, official university attempts to recruit students of color. All right, at all. Hey, I forget, not to mention faculty. Yes, I, I in fact was involved in one of the very first such efforts to go out again into local communities and again black communities, Native American communities, Chicano communities, and go door to door to recruiting students on it. That had not happened before. Uh, we have now have a, a, a wide array of services and initiatives that work on this campus again that again reverberated out of the Moral Hall table. 
I'm going to do this uh, because, as I said, as I said uh, many of our students are going to another activity. So why don't we take both of your questions? And uh, how many people are in line? Uh, maybe I'll decide on a couple of more. Yeah, take them all at once. So why don't, what are the two questions uh, over here? Um, I'm Madeline Rendon. I'm a senior at Dela Sol High School. And our question was, do you think the outcome of your efforts as student activists would be the same if you used the same methods you used back then today? Ooh. All right, and what, and the question behind you? Hi, my name is Rama Abdullahi, and my question is coming from a predominantly white suburban neighborhood at Burnsville. How can we incorporate African American and black studies starting at the elementary level so the first time we're not learning about our history is during an elective class, mainly our junior, senior year? All right. We're going to take the questions over here. We take them all at once now. Um, so the question that we had was, uh, how can we reclaim our authentic history as people of African descent so that we can heal uh, divisions and come together? How you doing, Michelle Ahmad? My question is, understanding the risk historically for political activists um, from Cointel Pro and how different things that come from it, like psychological uh, drug abuse, how do, what do you guys suggest to, how do we increase the political, critical consciousness within the Twin Cities, understanding the risk that comes with it? Okay. That, that, that it? All right, tough questions. Let's, let's go down the list. Um, how do you uh, build an African American studies from elementary school on? Not wait until what we do now, we're attempting to integrate African-American studies into high schools, but you got to start much earlier. It's vitally important that we start at home. You start at home and then you, you have parents who are willing to go into the schools and raise the question about what my children are receiving in curriculum. Uh, it is not going to happen by somebody else doing it. I'll have to do it myself. And I'll have to understand that it's, it's gonna take really more than just myself. But I have to be committed to it and get other people committed to it. And if you started at that, that lower level, that elementary school level, then just follow your children through that period and then you get other folk who also have that same issue that same interest to do the very same thing. You're developing a foundation, some structure, and you cannot do it without having that foundation and structure. Let me, let, let me just move on to the next question. Uh, and I'm gonna ask this one of you. Uh, it's uh, Deshaun's question about how do we increase the political consciousness of folk here in the Twin Cities? Well, uh, you know, so we need to do some of the same things that we've been doing. As we speak, there are people all over this country in the black community who are trying to organize, who are making a response to this system of oppression. Never think it's just one way. That's a bad way to think. You know, it's not either this or that. It's both and. It's yes and no and so forth. That's where we are. That's what life is. There are serious activists all over the black community. You can partly tell by the vocabulary. That's one. What are we pushing now? Don't call racism racism. Call it what it is. White supremacy. There's one doctrine that run over rise this country. It comes out of the Western world. It's white supremacy. You know, they, well, you can know a white person might flinch, you have to flinch. Yeah. Because that's the truth. What is segregation? Slavery was a caste system, just like the untouchables in India. That's what it was, as it were hereditary. All of my great grandparents were enslaved, I didn't say slave, enslaved by this country. That's a fact. <laughs> and John, uh, the last couple of questions around an authentic history to help us heal across the diaspora. So, several of the questions dealt with. It's clear that you're grappling with the issue about what you, what you can do in your schools. One of the things, again, that you have emphasized this argument, that obviously is the, is the need to organize to raise consciousness and do so yourself. But you also have to recognize that part of what's happening in this, in the K-12 
uh, schools is not so much that the administrators are trying to withhold from you knowledge that you desire that they somehow are, 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 are holding captive, but to recognize, in, in, in fact, that, that most of the, the teachers and administrators you encounter do not know themselves these things. They are not trained. All right? Our College of Education and, and, and Human Development on this campus, which is one of the most distinguished in the country, one of the most distinguished in the country, does not train its students all right, in the kind of cultural and historical materials that we're talking about. They have to send teachers again to our department, to other departments, and so forth. So, okay? That means that, that recognizing that, mm -hmm. that there's a learning process that has to place, take place that you will be learning yourself in the same time that you cajole all right, your parents, family, friends, and the teachers and administrators in the school system. And if I, as, as you recognize as well, that these, these schools, these public funded systems are responsible ultimately to you. Right. Responsible ultimately to you as citizens of this state. Thank you, John. Let's give our panel a big round of applause. On John's last note, let me just shout out to the CIS students who are in the room. They are part of that elective. We're introducing uh, African American studies into several high schools here in the Twin Cities. Much appreciative for them being in the space. You can see the kind of questions they're asking, so something must be clicking. Uh, <laughs> I know it's about time uh, for some of them to be moving on. I wanted to just shout out to their other Marl Hall activists, uh, fellow travelers who are in the space. Uh, you've heard Mr. Winfield's name mentioned, Mr. T. Williams' name mentioned. If y'all are in the space, you were back here 50 years ago, would you please stand up? You're going to see some of those folks. Thank you so much. We have uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, one has to do, and I don't see a neuro in the space. Uh, we have um, one of our uh, past students who is um, struggling for his life. And we wanted you all to know, I don't have the materials, but there is a way to support him. Uh, Farouk Alajaman, who uh, actually uh, established the Black History Month uh, calendar and was a part of the Africana uh, Studies uh, group as well as uh, the organization that's now the Black Student Union. And so I wanted to lift up his name and uh, we can perhaps get more information out to uh, you all about that. Uh, secondly, there is another major conference coming uh, to the campus in July. Uh, we have a whole series of events that you'll get the calendar on. But Free Minds, Free People will be here in July. We hope to see all of you uh, here. Uh, Brian, are you anywhere that you can just make a quick shout out on that? Oh, Diddy? 